<laughs> yep, so I'm quite pleasantly surprised at how much folks have gathered today. A couple of months ago, we had an event here when our uh, chief multi-cloud architect presented the high-level overview of our uh, migration to public cloud. And I thought that maybe I would like to take this topic and dive a little bit more deeper into it, not just, you know, uh, something was written in a corporate headlines, uh, but how things are actually done in practice. My goal for today's conversation actually is to give you an idea how cloud automation platforms work and how we here at Danske Bank are reasoning with infrastructure. And some, of course, will be quite pleasant to surprise that we are using quite a bit of Python tools here at Danske Bank, because uh, I guess many consider Danske to be that net Java mainframe workshop, very much unlikely to host events as such. So to move forward about the migration, first we need to look at the uh, goals, why, why we're doing this. Uh, I guess the most prominent one, ones are these, to unlock new capabilities. This one is, I guess, quite straightforward. Uh, AWS has way more functions than you could ever build on-prem. There's no point for us to compete with them, uh, as for them it's the primary business, not so much for us. So it's better that we leverage their capabilities. Another one, this one's a bit of controversial, uh, reducing operating costs. Uh, if you would take the infrastructure that we have here and move it as it is to the public cloud, well, it's nothing. It's nothing close to reducing costs. Uh, because only highly cloud-optimized applications actually could end up being cheaper on the public cloud. To have an idea of what is this migration about, first we need to look at the landscape of Danske Bank infrastructure, its components. So uh, our main building blocks are these. Uh, the first, the largest circle, is an enclave. Uh, for us, it's just the subnet ranges. But not just that, <laughs> it's not that simple, it's never is. Uh, what it does is actually encapsulates all the infrastructure components that we have underneath. It's something like an application boundary. So whenever it's an enclave, we could consider, well, it's an application, it's something in it. Uh, this further is split into micro segments. So uh, within the enclave, we have micro segments. Uh, these contain virtual machines, those, of course, uh, those micro segments could be in different availability zones. Uh, more complex applications could have uh, availability zone load balances because we need to balance people of this availability zones, uh, components inside of these uh, enclaves and between the micro segments are communicating. We have some firewall rules. So those are like a main building blocks. Uh, the main components of the applications that we have here at Danske Bank. Those applications uh, can have any shape or form. Some are a bit more complex, some are smaller, uh, some are between multiple easy, some are single easy, some are pretty simple and stuff. Uh, but the things where it starts to get interesting, the interactions, like each application is communicating with one another. And if you look at it from the side, it would start looking like it's, it's a complete mess. How would you migrate anything like this? It's like this is connected to that one and this, and then some kind of connectivity loop. So uh, this looks like a, a very complex feat and so on, because if we look at the infrastructure now, that means like uh, we have 17,000 virtual machines, uh, 9,000 enclaves, uh, I guess somewhere around the 5,000 micro segments. So it's lots of applications, each uh, talking with each other. Some are higher criticality, some lower, and we need to migrate them all to the public cloud without, uh, well, not impacting our availability, which at the bank level, well, it, it's quite expensive to not be available. Uh, so this migration, uh, we're executing it in, in three steps. If you look at it pragmatically, we're planning the ways, we're doing this migration automation and everything falls into this landing zone. Uh, wave planning is where we try to gather all the data that we have about the infrastructure, all its relationship, what it connects to, what components it consists to. So we're building this uh, large database we call meta database. Uh, we're taking all this data from this meta database, putting it into migration automation where we have cut over tool to orchestrate 
this migration and all the applications should eventually fall into landing zone. Uh, I have a diagram here, which is well quite a bit of a complex, but uh, the main thing, well, this is an AV, our AVS uh, implementation of network design. Uh, the main things here are uh, two sides, the right and the left. Uh, on the right side, uh, we have something what I guess most of our, you are more used to, where you each uh, application it, it gets well, their separate AWS accounts. They're operating within them. They have full access to them. They can build the components. But well, in essentially, they need to know all the details of how to operate in operate in AWS and they need to understand all the components on the risk of using them, how should they connect them, how to make them secure. So eventually, that's where we expect all the applications to land once we modernize them. But to not delay this, well, until infinity, because, well, at the bank scale, it takes forever until each and every application owner modernizes their applications. We want to close up private cloud as soon as possible because it's, it's very, well, infrastructure landscape becomes very uh, diverse and it's hard to reason it when you have something on-prem, something on public cloud. So that's why we came up with this landing zone, which is marked here as CLZ. We're creating our on-prem infrastructure copy uh, in AWS. So we're implementing the same zones, uh, the same environments, and essentially the idea is to have our on-prem infrastructure in AWS. But this is the zone where users don't have direct access. They're actually orchestrating everything through our cloud automation platform. So it's not like they need to know any of AWS. They're operating the very same as they do now. And how would you uh, get infrastructure now? So supposedly you need a server. Uh, so right now we have this Cloud2 platform which is a cloud automation platform. Uh, basically, you would request it, uh, this uh, machine, and we will run our automation workflows to uh, deliver you a server configured according to our specifications and uh, our needs. Uh, so, but the users, they don't really ever access the server directly. It's, well, it's a bank, it's always something in the middle which is tracking you or it's not, well, it's not Wild West. You cannot like directly get there and mess up something. So you either go through CyberArk uh, window or you, you're pushing code through your CI CD platforms. And of course, we have a lot of tooling that we need to preset, which is, will be patching, chap, the security scans. So essentially, if we would manage to keep all this uh, working in AWS experience for the developer, in theory, should be the same because he'll be using the same tools uh, and machine for him. Well, uh, he will access it the very same way and manage it the very same way. So this cloud platform, I guess, for many of you who's working with Python, especially like you know, web applications, this stack is, I guess, it's pretty familiar. Uh, uh, under the hood, we have the Django REST framework. Uh, use, it's just an API which takes in requests and runs salary workflows to orchestrate the infrastructure provisionings. So it will take a request, it will throw it into Rabbit, the salary will pick it up, and it will call these infrastructure APIs, whether it will be uh, VMware, ARI automation, maybe uh, later stages it's uh, Forte Manager to configure firewalls, uh, Chef, Vault, many tools we have. Uh, supported in this Cloud2 platform. Uh, and users uh, interact with it via UI or we have created the Terraform provider for it. So essentially they can Terraform their infrastructure uh, in our Cloud2 portal. And of course we have some additional components you know, for the caching to make this uh, portal a bit more interactive. We have the web sockets. Uh, so essentially it's just an uh, API with an uh, a synchronous uh, task processing engine uh, to make this 
performant one. Many, many people say, well, in the back end, this, I mean, Django S framework, well, it's not very fast. So we'd rather use this fast API or whatever. But infrastructure, in a sense, it, it, nothing is really fast there. So what you really want to focus on is mostly on parallelizing your infrastructure provisioning tasks, making them it important so that uh, whenever something fails, you could just retry. You don't need to uh, jump into and try to untangle whatever mess you have created. Um, so if anyone would want to venture into creating their cloud automation platform, uh, we basically use this uh, open service broker API. This API implements this spec. Um, I, I don't want to really bore you much with these details of, of what the spec is, but it's essential for the conversation to understand these main components. So the service object, uh, if you would take an example, Imagine uh, the magazines that you used to receive in your mailbox, you know, the catalog items of some electronic shop. Uh, each catalog item is basically a service object. So it's, it's uh, I don't know, a computer, a ATV, a printer. So each of those are catalog items. Service instance, however, is uh, an instantiation of that. So you picked a computer and you got this instance that arrived at your door, the actual machine, and then you do operation on it. Well, maybe you need to turn it on, you need to add some more RAM, uh, you want to restart it or whatever. So everything ends up into being some, some kind of operation. Um, if you would look at this very, very, very pragmatically, essentially, uh, if you take this OSWAPI framework, you implement its uh, service instance component, and to support another more clouds, well, it's just well, adding another uh, cloud provider, as many as you want. But essentially, you just have to be able to identify the cloud resource within, within it. In AWS, that would be RN. Uh, so idea, well, it's just a data model. But essentially, if you would take the current instance that we have, and we want to create it not on-prem, but in AWS, you basically look at these parameters and you would just uh, in instantiate different workflows. So for on-prem, you need, uh, I think, one task chain. For AWS, you need a different task chain. But if the data model with all its parameters is the same, we throw it into our orchestration engine, essentially we expect to get the same output. So we're creating the instances, whether it's on-prem, or is it in uh, public cloud? So like this, essentially making a cloud two portal something more like multi-cloud two. So we're, like this, we're enabling these day two operations. Uh, that means you can operate uh, Danske Bank's building block, blocks uh, in AWS. So you have the same enclave, the same enclave in AWS. But but we need to execute the migration of these. Well, we have day two. Well, we, we can operate, they create new instances there, but we need to move them. So, so moving part, we need to translate them. So we'd have this uh, enclave, but in AWS, there's, there's no such thing as enclave. But we would still want to keep it as something what defines application boundaries. For micro segments, we'll, 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 we'll translate them into security groups. Uh, uh, firewall will also be just policies, connectivity policies between the security groups. And the machines themselves were replicating using this AWS migration service as MGN. So once we have this all infrastructure components set up in the AWS, then we could move the machines there. Uh, on how to do that, we had many ideas. The, before we used to uh, orchestrate immigration with external tool, not involving a cloud automation platform. But then we had the problem that if you do it like this, well, uh, you orchestrate with some external tool, but you would still need to uh, have an idea of a state. You have to synchronize everything back to this portal so that we would have this database of everything on what connects where, well, what is what. Uh, and we really need to keep everything the same because if 
some external tool, the orchestra is something, and each time it builds different result, that this infrastructure essentially becomes inconsistent. So it's very hard to reason with it later. So to solve this, we came up with the idea that it's better to uh, do it in discrete actions. So we decided to implement three actions for the migration. It's duplicate, cleanup, and rollback. Duplicate is when we take the on-prem service instance uh, with all the same parameters they have on-prem, and we try to create AWS instances fr from them. And of course, we need to back, up, back it up in case we'll need to restore it. For cleanup, that's straightforward. You just have to remove this uh, backed up instance and you leave the AWS. So the migration is complete, well, you have to clean it up. Rollback is when things start going sideways and you need to restore the data and uh, remove whatever you created in AWS because, well, you may need to try it again with the next wave of migration. So, using these discrete actions, uh, we're, we're utilizing a cutover tool. Supposedly here we want to migrate app one and app two to AWS. So this cutover tool will go through each of the component it uh, detected the uh, relationship it found in meta database. It will duplicate this into AWS. So right here we're moving app one and app two. So creating all the micro segments and clips inside of a AWS setting up all the connectivity for it, and then we'll try to migrate instances there. Uh, however, suppose this something went wrong with app one. We move the machines there, but we see some problems. Application is not operating expected. So we're using these very same discrete actions to, to move it back in. Uh, so in this way, we issued a, a rollback on firewall one, two, and all the components of app one, and uh, we have to reduplicate this firewall uh, one copy because essentially uh, the boundary is being crossed anyways. Because it, it, uh, at first it was all in AWS, now it crosses the boundary. So we roll back it and duplicate it again. So with these very simple discrete actions, we're well, moving up our infrastructure to AWS in steps. Um, and afterwards, we just need to clean it up. Uh, once we are complete. Um, going forward, right now, uh, we're starting the very simplest applications, which are not that critical, and we can afford to have some downtime. But with each, each and every wave, applications will start getting more and more complex, and we'll start adding more and more capabilities uh, of type of instances that we can migrate. We'll focus on OpenShift, having this all load balances, AZLBs, MS SQLs, Rabbits, Cassandras, whatever, up until we are able to migrate criticality one and two. But this will require us to do this, you know, live migrations, whenever the orchestration engine will become, become more solid and will be more confident to tackle these high criticality applications. But I guess this is, at this point of time, this is all I wanted to share with you today. Uh, thank you for sticking with me. Uh, uh, I would ask you, if, if, if you find this interesting, of course, let's connect, because we're likely needing more by soldiers in our squad too, as, as immigrations become more and more complex. And of course, follow us on Danske Bank uh, if you want to join events as such. So thank you. <laughs>